Platinum Reserve and a proposal to suspend purchases for the reserve to reduce gas prices. This is about an hour and a half. Good morning and uh, welcome to uh, this um, uh, hearing by the Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming um, on the uh, subject of pumping up prices, the strategic petroleum reserve and record gas prices. This summer, families all across America will pile into their cars to take their vacations. Unfortunately, as a result of nearly eight years of the Bush administration's energy policy, they will face gas and oil prices that are skyrocketing out of control with no end in sight. Earlier this week, oil reached yet another all-time high, trading above $119 per barrel. The price of oil has risen by $100 hundred dollars a barrel since President Bush took office. American consumers are paying the price at the pump for this administration's failed energy policy. They are being tipped upside down by the big oil companies. They are being tipped upside down by OPEC with money being shaken out of their pockets at the pump every day across America. Gas prices have more than tripled over the last six years. The price of a gallon of gas jumped 12 cents in just the last week alone, and more than a quarter in the past month. American families are now paying $3.53 per gallon every time they fill up, and the Department of Energy projects that gas may reach $4 a gallon by this summer. And what has been the response? Well, earlier this week from Energy Secretary Bodman, uh, in answer to his position on this energy crisis, this is what he said, quote, I have done everything I know how to do with OPEC. Well, rather than taking action to help consumers, it seems that the Bush administration's response is to throw up its hands <laughs> and to say that there is nothing to be done. Well, there are things that can be done. Earlier this year, the House passed legislation that would redirect $18 billion in tax breaks for big oil to promote renewable fuels and clean energy. However, the Bush administration continues to oppose this legislation that would move us away from a fossil fuel future and help provide consumers with long-term relief from high oil and gas prices. Democrats in the House have passed four bills this Congress to address high prices and uh, break our dependence on oil. This administration has answered with tax breaks for big oil and tough breaks for American consumers. The Bush administration is ignoring actions that would provide consumers with relief right now. The United States currently purchases 70,000 barrels of oil every day to fill the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which already contains over 700 million barrels and is roughly 97 percent full. By law, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve must be filled, quote, as expeditiously as possible without incurring excessive costs are appreciably affecting the price of petroleum products to consumers. With the price of oil at $119, removing 70,000 barrels of oil a day from the market to fill the reserve is both incurring excessive cost for the Federal Government and affecting, in a negative way, runaway oil and gas prices. Based on projections, by the Bush administration's own Department of Energy, ending the fill of the reserve could reduce prices by about $2 per barrel of oil and $0.05 cents per gallon of gas. Not only should the Bush administration stop filling the reserve, 
It should also release oil onto the world market as a weapon to end escalating prices. These two actions would send a strong signal to speculators and to OPEC that Americans won't be held hostage by high prices by OPEC or big oil. Earlier this month, the number two executive at ExxonMobil testified before this committee that speculation, along with geopolitical instability and a weakening dollar, was responsible for half of current oil prices, that based only on oil supply and demand, the price of a barrel of oil should be only $50 to $55 a barrel. However, President Bush continues to refuse to use the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to pop the speculative bubble. The Bush administration is willing to deploy our National Guard reserves in Iraq, but it refuses to deploy our oil reserves to protect consumers and our economy. If President Bush were to announce his intention to release oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve today, it would put an immediate end to the speculative feeding frenzy that is driving up prices. Releasing oil from the reserve is something that can be done to help American families this summer. It is high time that the Bush administration does it. Now I would like to turn to recognize the ranking member of the Select Committee, uh, the gentleman from the State of Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I am not going to make a partisan ramp this morning because this is a serious problem and it should rise above partisanship. Uh, sometimes administrations have tapped the Strategic Petroleum Reserve effectively. Sometimes they haven't done it and there have been consequences. Sometimes they have done it and it has been ineffective. Sometimes they haven't done it and it has been effective. And I don't know whether tapping the Strategic Petroleum Reserve or not uh, is going to uh, help or have no effect on the cost of high gas prices uh, here in America. What I will say is that the problem that we face uh, is one of lack of supply. And the Chairman referred to the hearing that we had earlier this month where either the CEOs or their representatives of the five major domestic oil companies came to testify. And in my five minutes of questioning, I asked them point blank what would be the single most important thing that Congress can do to lower uh, prices of gas at the pump. And every one of them said increase domestic production. Now, what's this Congress done? We have voted down every effort to increase domestic production. Uh, we have tax or taken away tax credits for domestic production, which was referred to by the chairman, which means it's cheaper to buy oil from OPEC uh, because we have taxed domestic production so high. Now, it seems to me the time has come to quit the partisan shots and to start going back to economics 101. We do need to increase the supply of petroleum. Uh, tapping the domestic petroleum reserve or not filling it any further is going to be literally a drop in the bucket compared to the huge amount of oil that is used both in the United States and worldwide. But I think that we ought to start looking at serious issues uh, relative to this rather than trying to get sound bites on the network news. And I hope this hearing will allow us to get serious and yield back the balance of my time. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New York State, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was uh, recalling that hearing myself, and it was interesting to hear the uh, CEOs of the five top oil companies, as the ranking member said, uh, their main recommendation was to increase domestic production just happens to be production of the product that they make profits on. In fact, record profits in the history of, of all industries uh, in recorded time. Um, we are, in fact, working on increasing domestic production of many other kinds of fuels uh, to try to phase out the uh, oil uh, dependency, not just foreign, but oil dependency in general that is damaging the environment, damaging our balance of trade deficit, damaging our health, damaging the climate 
damaging our standing in the world and our, our uh, uh, involvement, uh, very costly involvement, I might say, in uh, military conflicts in unstable parts of the world to secure those oil uh, uh, supplies. But uh, everybody here knows that uh, oil and gasoline has gone through the roof already exceeding $4 in some parts of the country. We didn't get into this hole overnight, and there's no silver bullet that will get us out of it immediately. I'm proud that Congress has acted to pass sweeping legislation to raise fuel economy, provide tax incentives for green energy, energy de development, and establish a green-collar workforce so that we can get back to uh, being a leader, being the leader in the world in energy and economic policy on the right track, rather than giving other countries a 20 or 30 head start on uh, year, a 20 or 30 year head start on such things as hybrid uh, vehicles. Uh, people in my district uh, talk to me, my constituents in the 19th District of New York talk to me about how much they want to do and what they can do. What from the students, high school students at a, uh, Arlington High School in Dutchess County, New York, who recently uh, uh, put together plans for a solar uh, system on the roof of their high school and got half the money from New York State, and I was able to secure the other half of them in a private grant for them um, to uh, a, a local uh, company that's making ethanol uh, gas that they can spin a turbine with and make electricity, uh, and, uh, and also hydrogen that they can fuel hydrogen uh, uh, fuel cells from, from municipal solid waste. There's such a wide range, uh, not just solar and wind and all the geothermal and the ones everybody talks about, but there are a lot of new sources of energy that are coming uh, to play and that with the proper subsidies and the proper uh, investments uh, and research and development dollars will come to play. So I would uh, uh, hope that that's the direction that we'll go in and I encourage uh, what the Chairman's suggesting that for now in this crisis situation we stop uh, purchasing uh, oil for the strategic reserve and I yield back. A gentleman's time. Uh, has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Shattuck. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I would like to commend you for calling this hearing on gas prices and more specifically on what is pumping them up and what we can do about it. I want to begin by welcoming uh, a fellow Arizonan and a personal friend, Dave Berry, Vice President of Swiss Transportation. I believe you'll find him to be very knowledgeable about, about the impact of high fuel prices uh, on our entire economy. Uh, and I think you'll, I, I know I'm looking forward to his testimony, and I think. Uh, it will be helpful to the committee. High gas prices are an extremely serious problem for uh, all Americans, American consumers and American businesses. Uh, and therefore, it's important that we identify the reason for those high prices and, more important, that we do what we can to alleviate them. Uh, I think in this committee I have repeatedly said they are a unique problem for those of us, those of us out west who drive, drive great distances, uh, both in commuting back and forth to work or in taking summer vacations. In many instances, much more travel, much more driving time, and much more mileage than those who live in, in the East. I would suggest that uh, gas prices are most appropriately addressed by looking at the relationship between supply and demand. Uh, during the last 25 years, world energy demand has increased by uh, 60 percent. The Energy Information Administration predicts that demand in the United States alone will grow by 19 percent through 2030. I wholeheartedly agree, as the Chairman knows, with his sentiment that we have to find alternate forms of energy. But every single expert that's been before this committee and that I have talked to has said that at least in the short run, we are looking at an oil-based economy, at least for today. We're talking about the price spike in gasoline over the last 60 to 90 days, uh, or at most over the last 12 months, which has been stunning and has had uh, a dramatic impact on uh, our constituents. I don't think that uh, alternative forms of energy are going to go at that issue. And so we're looking at part at whether or not speculation has driven up the demand. One issue here today is could we deal with that speculation by addressing the SPRO and perhaps le releasing some fuel from it? I would suggest that uh, a much greater signal in the wrong direction has been sent to speculators by all of the potential sources of oil that we have locked up in this country and made unavailable on the Outer Continental Shelf, in the Inner Mountain West, uh, in coal to shale uh, or shale to oil programs, and that we have sent, at least in the short run in this Congress, by refusing to adopt policies that would open up uh, our domestic supply, even where it can be done in a very rational and safe way, uh, the wrong signals which have driven up the cost of uh, gasoline for our consumers uh, dramatically 
in the short run. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses for agreeing to testify here today. Many of the issues that we consider in Congress um, are topics that the average person may not, uh, may only really can uh, consider in their daily lives. But I can tell you, the issue we're discussing today, people are watching, they're interested in. Uh, you can ask any commuter in my district or around the country how much it costs for them to fill their tank of gas uh, the last time, and they'll tell you the exact number. And they'll tell you how much more it was than uh, the, they paid the week before. So this is an issue that's affecting everybody's lives in this country. Uh, and in our current economy, oil and gas do drive progress. Uh, whether you're just going to the beach or you're driving to work on a Thursday, high gas prices are a constant <coughs> consideration. Uh, given the uh, recent increases in prices and the prospect for this continuing, I'm hopeful that that panel today can shed some light on the importance of the strategic petroleum reserve, uh, how we might be able to lower the price of gasoline by manipulating uh, what goes in and what doesn't go in the SPR. Uh, and I'm looking forward to your testimony to help us understand that. And with that, I yield back. Great. Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Uh, thank you. I think there are four things we can do about energy prices, three short term and one long term. The administration has done zero out of those four and we are here to talk <laughs> about them. I just want to outline them. First, we can do something with the SPRO to send a signal to the speculators which are a significant part of the reason for the run up in these, in these prices. We heard Exxon te uh, Vice President Simon tell us that speculation was a significant part for the reason for these extraordinary volatile prices. What we can do is send a message to the speculators that we are going to stop at least increasing the capacity of the SPRO. And the reason is, is when your house is on fire, it is more important to get the hose than an additional policy of insurance. And that is the situation right now. We need some water. We need less insurance at the moment. That is clearly something we should do. That is the first thing. The administration has refused to do it. Second, we should clearly bring in the over-the-counter market for oil futures into the jurisdiction of the Commodities Future Trading Commission. We have these markets transparent and open and regulated in oranges, soybeans, wheat, sorghum, but not oil and gas. It is insane to have such a fundamental part of our economy open for the Wild West speculation that is going on right now driving up these prices. That is number two. The administration has refused to help us. Third, Senator Cantwell and I have called for the formation of a task force. Uh, in the Justice Department to send a signal again to the markets of the seriousness to, to, uh, to uh, follow the law and have transparency in these markets. That is the third thing the administration has failed to do. The fourth term is the long term. And what the American people understand that all of the things we are going to talk about today are short term. They are not permanent fixes to this problem. The permanent fix to this problem is found in groups like a couple of people I met in my office yesterday. They are the leaders of the Phoenix Motor Car Company who are going to bring an all-electric car to market in June from Ontario, California that you can drive on all electricity for 120 miles for $3 for 120 miles. That is the solution. The administration refused to help us move in that direction. We have got to do all four. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Great. Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognizes the uh, gentleman from uh, Connecticut, Mr. Larson. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to thank the chairman and thank the witnesses uh, for being here this afternoon. Let me follow on uh, with the uh, reasoning of um, my esteemed colleague from Washington uh, uh, State. Uh, at a previous uh, hearing, uh, we've heard from a number of executives um, in the oil and gas business um, around this whole issue of uh, speculation. The Independent Connecticut Petroleum Dealers Association tells uh, heart-rendering story after story of uh, citizens who receive their Social Security checks turning around and handing them over to them. They say that the rules of supply and demand no longer uh, apply with respect uh, uh, to uh, this issue, that in fact that speculation and greed uh, that is driving uh, the cost uh, up at the pump 
and clearly in the area of uh, home heating oil. These uh, rock rib Republicans uh, from my uh, district uh, have said that what needs to be done is that what we need to do is focus on this uh, speculation and require that uh, unless, in fact, you are the recipient of the commodity, you would not, you shouldn't ought to be able to use the declining dollar as a way to transfer paper or continue to speculate in such a manner that it raises the cost of uh, gas at the pump or home eating oil that is distributed uh, to your home. I am interested in hearing uh, from all of you and concur with my other colleagues outlining of the issues that confront us. Great. Gentlemen's, gentlemen's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentlelady from South Dakota, Ms. Herseth Sandlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for having this important hearing and I thank our witnesses for testifying. Uh, to reiterate some of the important points made by some of my colleagues, I represent the entire state of South Dakota, a very rural state, and so you can imagine uh, the impact that record gas prices are having on families and businesses across the state. While we have been one of the leaders in biofuels production, uh, that it has had a moderating influence on the gas price of gas, upwards of 15 percent, as we have seen in some analysis uh, that we explored with oil companies, company executives that generally agreed, although they didn't think that it was upwards of at least 15 percent, uh, that ethanol has been able to, uh, again, moderate the price that we would see otherwise if we didn't have ethanol production today. Uh, but I do think it is important as we explore with our witnesses today the other impacts I have long advocated in times of record gas prices, whether it was last year, the year before, or now, uh, that we not continue to add oil to the Strategic Petroleum Reserve uh, to help alleviate some of the market pressures. But I would also like to explore with the witness today the impact of our domestic refining capacity, as well as how we develop a plan for the SPR in light of the projected effects of last year's energy bill. And the, and the standards that we put in and what that is projected to save us in terms of imported oil over time. So, again, I thank the Chairman and the witnesses and look forward to um, their testimony. Great. General Ladies, time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, too, uh, welcome our witnesses, look forward to uh, some uh, thoughtful interaction. Uh, it is important that we focus on three things in my judgment. One is making sure that we have a transparent and fair market. Look forward to exploring that. Uh, second is being sensible about what the Federal Government itself does. It is not just the Strategic per, uh, Petroleum Reserve, but how we as the largest consumer of petroleum in the world for our military and other act actions uh, do the best possible job of stretching that resource. And finally, uh, with the work of this committee, look comprehensively at how we are going to deal with rebuilding and renewing this country to provide more choices to people so they are not sentenced to buy, um, if they want to buy a gallon of milk, they have to burn a gallon of gas because of how we organize our communities, the limited transportation choices that people have and how we have uh, failed in terms of promoting more technology. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate what you have done with this committee looking at the big picture, not just as we are today with one piece of it, but how all of them fit together. And I look forward to our progress in looking at that bigger picture as we go on. Thank I, you. I thank you. Uh, I thank the gentleman from Oregon. And that completes uh, um, the time for opening statements for the members of the Select Committee. Uh, I note that we have a guest, Mr. Uh, Welsh uh, from Vermont, who is sitting in today, and we welcome you, sir, to the uh, hearing. Um, let me uh, now turn to our first witness. Uh, our, our first witness is Ms. Uh, Melanie uh, Kenderdine. Uh, she is the Associate Director of Strategic Planning for the MIT Energy Initiative. She's had a long career as well at the Department of uh, Energy. Uh, before that, we welcome you. Uh, whenever you're uh, comfortable, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Sensenbrenner, members of the committee, thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify today. 
While the SPR is our primary line of defense in the event of an emergency oil supply disruption, each day the current RAK program pulls 70,000 barrels of oil off tight markets at a time of record high prices and volatile geopolitics. Attention to market conditions and the willingness to act in a more flexible and creative manner could achieve the same result but enable lower cost options for filling the SPR as well as help address key other key energy priorities. The purposes and implementation of the original RIK program in 1999 provides an example of such creativity. In late 1998, oil prices hit historic lows. While moderate oil prices are good for consumers, extremely low prices shut in wells, decimate, decimate the workforce, particularly in the oil producing regions of the country, and destroy the technical infrastructure of the industry, impacts that lead to lower supplies and higher prices in the future. To help mitigate these adverse impacts, the Clinton administration established the RIK program. This provided a market outlet for domestic oil in a glutted market and enabled DOE, without the need for new appropriations, to replace 28 million barrels of oil in the SPR that had been sold two years earlier, largely at the jet, jet direction of Congress, simply to generate revenues. The current RIK program is operating under market conditions that are precisely the opposite of those that the original program was established to exploit. In fact, two energy secretaries in both Democratic and Republican administrations elected to pursue the path of do no harm with the RIK program. Secretary Richardson in 2000 and Secretary Abraham in 2003 deferred deliveries under the RIK program for fear that removing even small amounts of oil from the market would increase prices to consumers. Another authority where creativity and flexibility can and should be employed is exchanging oil to acquire oil. We first used this, this in a significant way to establish a home heating oil reserve in the Northeast in 2000. Chairman Markey was a major uh, uh, a supporter of that effort. The rapid stand-up of this reserve, absent appropriations to do so, was accomplished by using this authority and cost us no money. We also conducted a time exchange of oil in September of 2000 when heating oil inventories in New England were 72 percent lower than in the previous winter. On September 22nd that year, the President directed the Secretary to conduct a time exchange of SPR oil, in effect loaning the market 30 million barrels of oil. The results were immediate. Spot prices dropped by almost 20 percent. By the end of the year, actual oil prices had decreased by 34 percent and there was adequate heating oil supplies for the winter. Importantly, this exchange of 30 million barrels of oil ultimately returned over 35 to the reserve, or a 17 percent interest payment on that loan. At today's prices, this equates to an additional half billion dollars of oil in the reserve at no cost to the taxpayer. The energy bill passed last December established the foundation for alternative energy security pathways. Conservative estimates are that by 2022, provisions in that law will reduce net oil imports ports by well over 2 million barrels per day in effect increasing the insurance value of the SPR without adding any additional oil to the reserve. Between now and then, however, we have to meet what I call the 80-80-40 challenge, replacing current, the current 80 percent fossil fuel consumption with 80 percent carbon free or carbon light uh, uh, energy, renewable energy and, and sequestration to avoid the doubling of CO2 emissions in approximately 40 years. That 40 years also roughly equates to the time it will take us to turn over the energy infrastructure. Replacement costs of that infrastructure is estimated to be $12 trillion. Um, to do this, we will need uh, uh, to uh, find new ways to finance key energy technologies and research. Total energy R&D investment, investment in both the U.S. and in, in the U.S., both public and private, is estimated to be around five to six billion dollars a year. And according to GAO, DOE's total budget authority for energy R&D has dropped by over 85 percent since 1978. I offer, without advocating, three options for your consideration. First, an outright sale of 40 million barrels of oil from the SPR would generate around $4.5 billion in new revenues. That could help pay, for example, Cong Congressman Inslee's Apollo project. This would have the added benefit of lowering prices to consumers. 
Notwithstanding attacks that this would diminish our energy security, I note that this would reduce the amount of oil in the SPR to around 660 million barrels, roughly 60 million barrels more than was in the reserve when we went to war in Iraq. Presumably that was deemed sufficient to go to war in the Middle East. Or, uh, second, temporarily suspend the current RIK program, and forcing the sale of that oil into the open market could provide at least a billion new dollars to fund key energy research programs. And finally, exchanging 50 million barrels of sweet crude in the reserve for heavy oil in the open market, if done correctly, could net roughly $500 million without reducing the overall volume of the reserve by a single barrel. This combined with the roughly $590 million currently in the SPR account would also provide an additional billion dollars for energy research at no cost to the taxpayer. In closing, please uh, yes. in closing, sir, the current policy of taking royalty oil in a continuous flow, regardless of market signals, ignores many of these lessons. It is a waste of taxpayer dollars to uh, put oil in the reserve at today's prices when futures markets offer the same oil at a lower price 12 months from now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. We very much appreciate that. Um, our next uh, witness, Dr. Mark uh, Cooper. Uh, is the Director of Research at the Consumer Federation of America uh, and uh, has testified many times on these subjects before Congress. Welcome, Dr. Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to testify on this important issue. We estimate that over the past six years, household expenditures on gasoline and motor oil uh, have more than doubled, rising by over $1,200. In a recent national poll earlier this month, we found that 73 percent of respondents are greatly concerned about rising gasoline prices and 60 percent are greatly concerned about Mideast imports. Thus, the pocketbook and national security implications of our oil addiction, which are the subject of this hearing, are top of mind for consumers. Our research shows that current high gasoline and oil prices are the result of a long-term combination of an international crude oil cartel and a tight domestic refining oligopoly, both of which have systematically underinvested in production capacity. By failing to expand production capacity to meet demand and provide a reasonable reserve in an industry with very low elasticities of supply and demand and that is prone to accidents and disruptions, they have created tight and volatile markets from which they profit. While crude oil is the largest component of gasoline costs, there have been months over the past five years when the domestic spread the amount that domestic refiners and marketers take at the pump has been over $1 per gallon. That is domestic $1. Moreover, the tug of war between OPEC and the domestic refining industry over the extraction of consumer surplus has pushed up prices. The U.S. gasoline market accounts for about one quarter of all the gasoline consumed in the world and is by far the largest single product market in the oil sector. As U.S. refining margins increase, OPEC receives the signal that the market will support higher prices and, as a rent-sinking cartel, pushes crude prices up so that they get their share of the available rents. So crude oil pushes gasoline prices up and U.S. gasoline prices pull crude oil up in a vicious anti-consumer spiral. Speculation has also played an increasing role in driving up the price of crude oil and gasoline as huge influxes of money increased volume, volatility and risk in those financial markets. A couple of years ago, the Senate Com Committee on Oversight and Investigations concluded that speculation accounted for one-third of the oil price. That is something like $38, not too far off what the oil executives told you a few weeks ago. In a well-functioning market, steadily growing demand, which we have had in the world, does not cause this powerful surge of prices or this huge increase in volatility. It is the failure on the supply side to invest, the concentration we allow to afflict the domestic refining industry, and barriers to entry that have allowed the cartel and the oligopoly to profit at the expense of the public, with speculators driving the process forward. At best, our strategic petroleum policy does us little good. At worst, the failure to have a comprehensive policy makes matters worse. We refused to fill the reserve in the 1990s when oil was $10 a barrel, and we refused to stop filling it 
when oil is $110 a barrel. That adds insult to injury. I don't believe that SBR fill or drawdown have, will have a significant impact on prices in the long term. However, in the short term, under certain circumstances, fill and drawdown can, in fact, affect speculative bubbles or short-term disruptions. Unfortunately, at its current size, the SPR is not a very credible source to execute those policies. We don't have enough to credibly threaten the markets uh, over a significant period of time. Size matters when it comes to the uh, strategic stockpiles. Since 1990, our stocks of crude oil have declined by 40 percent from 200 days of net imports to 100 days. On a percentage basis, our gasoline inventories have declined even more than that. Does anyone in this room believe that the world oil market has become 40 percent more secure in the last two decades? Not at all. Moreover, we do not have strategic refineries or a strategic product reserve when, in fact, refinery capacity and extremely tight gasoline inventories have been important causes of price increases over the past six years. The long-term solution to our oil addiction lies in reducing our consumption and increasing the supply of alternative transportation fuels. Congress took a big step in that direction with the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007. But even if every goal in that act is achieved, in 2022 we will still be consuming over 20 million barrels and importing over 10 million barrels. We will still have a major national oil security problem and need a more effective strategic policy. Strategic petroleum policy needs to be dramatically improved in three areas. Expand the crude reserve so we can use it as an economic weapon. It is too small. We treat it as a pure military strategy uh, reserve. Second of all, we should create a refinery reserve because the oil companies have made it clear they will not build enough capacity in the U.S. to meet our needs. And third, we need to build product reserves through a mix of public stockpiles and mandatory private reserves, which many European nations have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Cooper, very much. Our next uh, witness is, uh, Dr. is, is Mr. Uh, Dave Berry. Uh, he is the Vice President of Swift Transportation Incorporated, the nation's largest uh, uh, truckload carrier. And Mr. Berry is also the Chairman of the American Trucking Association's Environmental and Energy Policy uh, Committee. Uh, uh, the, the American Trucking Association represents over 37,000 American truck carriers. Uh, we welcome you, sir. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Dave Berry. I am the Vice President of Swift Transportation, a truckload carrier headquartered in Phoenix, Arizona. Swift operates more than 18,000 trucks and employs more than 21,500 hardworking, safe individuals. As a trucking company, Swift is dependent on a plentiful supply of diesel fuel. In fact, Swift purchases about 650,000 gallons of diesel fuel daily to ensure that our trucks are able to deliver freight on time to our customers. Last year, during the first quarter, Swift spent about $2.37 per gallon for diesel fuel. And this year, first quarter, we spent about $3.37 per gallon. This dramatic 42 percent year-over-year increase in the cost of diesel fuel is harmful to Swift and to the U.S. economy. I must add that earlier this week, the national average price for diesel fuel was $4.14. Today, I appear before you representing not just Swift, but the entire U.S. trucking industry. Um, you have heard about ATA. Uh, the trucking industry is the backbone of this nation's economy, accounting for more than 80 percent of the nation's freight bill and employing more than 8.5 million hardworking Americans. The trucking industry delivers virtually all of the consumer goods in the United States. We are an extremely competitive industry comprised largely of small businesses. Roughly 96 percent of all interstate motor carriers operate 20 or fewer trucks. Diesel fuel is the lifeblood of the trucking industry. Each year the trucking industry consumes over 39 billion gallons of diesel fuel. This means that a one cent increase in the average price of diesel costs the trucking industry an estimated $391 million in fuel expenses annually. 
and every penny increase in both gasoline and diesel costs all U.S. consumers nearly $2 billion. The average national price of diesel fuel is now $4.14 per gallon, nearly double what it cost in 2004. Based on current Department of Energy forecasts, the trucking industry will be forced to spend an incredible $141 billion on fuel this year. This is $29 billion more than in 2007 and more than double the amount we spent four years ago. Today it costs approximately $1,200 just to fill up a truck. As a result of this dramatic increase in the price of diesel, which has coincided with a downturn in the economy and a softening of demand for freight transportation services, many trucking companies are struggling to survive. Against this backdrop, we greatly appreciate the opportunity to discuss the Strategic Petroleum Reserve and other initiatives that could help address this speculative bubble that has materialized in petroleum markets. The remainder of my st statement highlights actions we believe Congress can take to help restore balance to the petroleum markets, increase supplies of petroleum, and lower the demand for petroleum. We are confident that these initiatives will help reduce the price of diesel fuel, which has been damaging the trucking industry and the economy. ATA has previously asked the Federal Government to temporarily stop filling the Strategic Petroleum Reserve and consider releasing oil from the SPRO to address this crisis. The SPRO currently stores just over 700 million barrels of crude oil, which is equivalent of a 58-day supply of imported oil for our nation, to, for our nation or a 9-day supply of the oil consumed globally. The U.S. currently deposited 70,000 barrels of crude oil into the SPRO each day. To suspend filling of the SPRO will reduce the global demand for oil and could help lower its price. There are undoubtedly many factors contributing to the run-up in fuel prices, but in a recent article in Investors Business Daily, an economist with the Institute of International Economics suggested that one of those factors was the SPR's renewed purchases of oil on the open market. ATA has also asked the administration to release oil from the SPR. While we know the SPR does not contain enough oil to permanently alter the supply of crude oil in the marketplace, we believe that strategic releases from the SPR could temporarily increase the supply of crude oil and hopefully help restore rational behavior to the petroleum markets. This type of government intervention could drive speculators out of the market and help ensure that petroleum prices are once again driven by supply and demand. We acknowledge that the rules governing the management of the SPR are the subject of an international agreement with other developed nations. This agreement limits our ability to use SPRO to address market irregularities and may be an issue that Congress should further investigate. We believe that temporarily halting the filling of the SPR and releasing oil from the SPR could have a positive impact on the speculative nature of today's petroleum prices. We recognize, however, that this step in and of itself will not address the long-term petroleum pricing issues. Uh, I have put uh, comments, additional comments on the records. I just summarized by saying that other uh, things to consider would be increasing domestic oil exploration, increasing domestic petroleum refining capacity, eliminating the tax subsidies for exported biodiesel, and enacting the National Fuel Standard for okay. diesel. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barry, very much. Uh, our next uh, witness is Mr. Kevin Book. He is the Senior Vice President and Analyst for Energy Policy, uh, Oil and Alternative Energy at Friedman Billings Ramsey uh, & Company. Uh, in those senior roles, he evaluates the impact of legislative actions on investment opportunities within the energy sector. Welcome, sir. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Mr. Chairman. Did you intend for me to go next or for? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Markey, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, distinguished members of the committee, for the privilege of contributing to your discussion today. The opinions I express this morning are my own and do not necessarily reflect the viewpoint of my employer. Uh, to summarize my remarks uh, as my testimony is. And by the way, a graduate of Tufts and, and Fletcher you, School of Diplomacy in my district, so a very well educated. You uh, were my congressman for six years, sir, yes. And, and uh, I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Uh, in my view, fundamental scarcity and geopolitical risk form the backdrop to today's, to today's discussion. Each day the world consumes just shy of 86 million barrels of petroleum and refined petroleum products. The infrastructure that supplies this oil 
It took nearly a century and a half and multiple trillions of dollars to evolve. In just the last five years, however, demand patterns have shifted dramatically. Since 2003, developed world oil, world oil consumption has remained essentially flat, while non-OECD demand has risen by approximately 18 percent. Simply put, the world's emerging economies have entered into their energy-hungry adolescence. I don't need to enumerate them here, but an unfortunate confluence of geopolitical risks threatens the stability of existing supply. This year's WTI futures price has averaged slightly more than $100 per barrel. As has been mentioned repeatedly, this is a significant premium to most fair estimates of extraction cost in the Gulf of Mexico and the Canadian tar sands. The dollar's decline against the euro and other currencies may be partly to blame. Producers may charge higher prices to compensate for value erosion. Increased speculative activity may play a small role as well, although speculators may also have more of an effect on the velocity of oil prices than their absolute levels. Speculators aren't the whole story. Commercial refiners of crude oil cannot operate their businesses without stable supply. They must bid up for oil at times of greatest perceived supply risk. In many commodity markets, this behavior can accelerate at capacity utilization levels above 90 percent. Three million barrels of global spare capacity and 86 million barrels of daily demand puts the global oil system at about 96 percent of capacity. And yet, one well-conceived U.S. energy policy keeps refiners from engaging in bidding wars and hoarding oil, Strategic Petroleum Reserve. The SPR primarily does ensure against the risk of a catastrophic supply interruption, but it provides other values too, other value too. Refiners assured of supply can operate at lower inventory and working capital levels. Assurance of supply in the event of an emergency can deter hoarding and gouging by market participants. To quantify the safety value of the SPR, you can talk in storage levels of barrels, but it might be better to express it in terms of the days of import coverage provided. That is the number of days, a number of barrels of storage divided by the number of barrels the nation imports each day. Import cover has fallen from the 100 day range in 1990 to estimates, depending on how you count it, between 58, which I think we heard, and uh, as high as 70, depending on what you think uh, demand is. Uh, and there's a variety of reasons for this. Uh, deterred investment uh, at low prices, conventional basins declining, increased household wealth, transportation use rising as well. The, uh, the suggestion I would make is that basing any fill decision on days of import cover rather than absolute supply level and using a thorough and ongoing assessment of supply risks might make it easier to deter uh, to determine fill rates and quantities and also easier to communicate that message and the importance of that message to the American people. Now, my view is that markets can sometimes provide useful predictions of future events, especially markets as big, liquid, and broadly traded as the oil market. And one might interpret $117 or even $100 oil as a risk premium that says maybe supply is riskier than we think and we should continue to fill the spro. I realize that is not a popular view at this point in time. Suspending the fill may do little, however, to affect price as long as the emerging world drives oil demand. There are linkages worth noting. U.S. imports feed overseas manufacturing, chemicals, and logistics demand for oil. The wealth exporters earn selling into the U.S. stokes demand at home. Subsidies overseas make energy users less sensitive to price. 70,000 barrels per day might quickly be absorbed with little or no price effect. U.S. circumstances can affect demand and global price. A serious recession, and hopefully this doesn't happen, here could could decrease demand by 300 to 400,000 barrels per day, and an echo overseas in China alone could account for another 250,000 barrels per day in decline. Creating that surplus with a non-emergency drawdown could affect price, particularly the first time it occurs and especially if it happens with little or no fanfare and surprises the market. On the other hand, the price effect might be very small relative to the social cost of effectively burning the nation's safety net in our gas tanks. Moreover, the price effect might be temporary, could be offset by demand growth, and OPEC cutbacks as well and could even set commodity market expectations so that traders view the SPRO as just another upstream oil supplier. Now, you can't run at full tilt for more than five months, as you know, and if you do, you're out of your safety net. Refiners have to buy more oil, and OPEC has more market power. So I think I would conclude by suggesting that there's, there's, there is risk that demand may start to soften of its own accord. There are also opportunities. One of these is that there is, there is a real call now to build on the good work you did last year the Energy Independence and Security Act, to add still greater standards. And when you make, when you make a cocktail, sometimes you marry two, two things that are bitter to come up with something sweet. And it's been suggested here today, the notion that you can marry increased domestic energy production, including biofuels, which are a very big part of it, with increased conservation, I think might be the drink that cools the summer driving season in years to come. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions.
Thank you so much, and, uh, and, and thank you for bringing w what you learned at Tufts about cocktails and energy policy uh, to this uh, hearing to put together an excellent metaphor. Uh, and our final witness is, Mr. is Dr. Frank Rusco. He is the Acting Director of Natural Resources and, Envi uh, uh, and Environment for the Office of the Government, uh, the, uh, the Government Accountability Office. Uh, he's been with the GAO for 10 years uh, and managed uh, uh, teams on wide ranges of issues in the energy field. We welcome you, sir. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Sensenbrenner, and members of the committee, I'm pleased to be here today to discuss how to reduce the cost of filling the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, as well as reduce the effect that filling the reserve is currently having on oil prices. The reserve now contains just over 700 million barrels of light oil and has about 27 million barrels of available capacity that DOE is currently planning to fill in the near term. DOE has also been directed to create and fill an additional about 300 million barrels of capacity. <coughs> With the price of light oil recently hitting almost $120 per barrel, this expansion can easily run into the tens of billions of dollars. Taking barrels of oil off the market to put in the reserve puts upward pressure on prices. However, there is no consensus on the magnitude of that effect, and, DO, and GAO does not have a position on that. In my testimony, I will discuss things DOE can do to reduce the cost of expanding the reserve and to improve its effectiveness during oil supply shocks. I will also suggest something DOE could do in the near term to achieve both these goals while reducing whatever upward pressure on light oil prices it currently is putting. First, DOE has not, but should put heavier grades of oil in the reserve because A, many U.S. refineries run most efficiently using heavier oil than what is currently in the reserve, and B, heavier oils are cheaper than light oils. <coughs> Second, DOE should put fewer barrels of oil into the reserve when oil prices are high and more when prices are low. This would save a great deal of money, and with record oil prices currently, there's no time like the present to act on this. DOE could achieve both these goals by immediately swapping some of the light oil in the SPR for heavy, heavier oils. This would allow DOE to expand the size of the reserve at lower cost because each barrel of light oil can be traded for more than a barrel of heavier oil and would also improve the SPR's effectiveness in the event of an oil supply disruption. Finally, it would have a dampening effect on the price of these light oils by putting them on the market now rather than taking them off. To elaborate on these points, our work indicates that about 40 percent of all crude oil used by U.S. refineries is heavier than what is currently in the reserve. Many U.S. refineries run most efficiently using these heavier oils, and in practice this means that during an oil supply disruption, many U.S. refineries would have to operate below capacity if they used oil from the reserve. This loss in capacity would reduce supplies of gasoline and diesel and exacerbate the economic effects of an oil supply disruption. DOE should put fewer barrels into the reserve when prices are higher and more when prices are lower. One way to do this is to buy a constant dollar amount of oil each month rather than buying a constant number of barrels. This approach, commonly referred to as dollar cost averaging, is very similar to what many of us do when we put steady monthly contributions into our 401k plans. Going forward, our simulations show that because oil prices are typically volatile, Using a constant dollar approach would save money as DOE adds to the reserve, whether oil prices are generally rising or falling. DOE could get heavier oils into the reserve by immediately using the agency's existing authority to swap some of the reserve's light barrels for heavier barrels. DOE did a reverse swap in 1998 when it traded the only heavy oil it had, about 11 million barrels, for 8 million barrels of light oil. If DOE swapped some light oil for heavy starting in the near term, it would have three main effects. I'm going all First, it would get heavier barrels into the reserve, which is itself a desirable goal. Second, DOE could fill the remaining capacity at lower cost because a barrel of light oil trades for more than a barrel of heavy oil. And third, swapping light for heavier barrels would put more light, on, light oil on the market now when light oil prices are as high as they've been in well, recent history. To conclude, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve protects our economy from oil supply shocks. 
It has been useful in the past, such as in the aftermath of Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. Currently, the reserve holds about 56, 58 days of net oil imports, but it will have to grow to maintain the same level of protection if demand for oil continues to rise. However, we have a large reserve now that can protect the economy from any but the most extreme supply disruptions. This allows us some flexibility to be smarter about how we add oil to the reserve. <coughs> Our work shows that several billion dollars could be saved and the reserve made more efficient by putting heavier oils into the reserve as soon as possible and by buying less when prices are higher and more when prices are lower. Both of these goals could be achieved in the near term if DOE used its authority to swap light or heavier barrels, and this would take pressure off the record light oil prices we're currently facing. Thank you. This completes my oral statement. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Rusco, very much. Uh, the, uh, the chair now turns to recognize himself for a round of questions. Um, right now, uh, OPEC and uh, Big Oil have a weapon aimed at the heart of the American economy. We're seeing its effects in the failure of airlines. Uh, we're seeing its effects in the uh, impact on truckers across our country. We're seeing its impact on the dramatic rise in the price of fuel. And we're going to see its uh, effect on a continuing basis uh, uh, on the decline in the American economy. The Strategic Petroleum Reserve was constructed uh, in order for the President uh, to use it uh, as a counter weapon in order to say to the world oil market uh, that we are serious about not allowing uh, uh, big oil and OPEC to exploit a vulnerability uh, in the American uh, uh, economic uh, structure. Um, Ms. Kennedy, uh, the Bush administration thus far has refused to deploy this uh, protective weapon uh, which we have, the, strat the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, meant to protect uh, businesses and consumers across our country. Uh, what, in your opinion, would be the impact uh, if uh, we, uh, as a country, under the President's instructions, stopped filling the Strategic Petroleum Reserve so that we reduced the amount of oil being taken off the world market and began to deploy uh, upwards of 40 million barrels of oil in the Strategic Petroleum Reserve and made that announcement today? Um, the other witnesses and, and I have indicated it is difficult to quantify the precise amount of uh, reduction in price that you would see. I would go back to, to the SPR exchange that we did in 2000. We put 30 million barrels of oil onto the market, loaned it. Wasn't it wasn't a sale. We put $30 million as a loan. Um, and, and to put that in context, I think at that time the, uh, it was with the world consumption in, in a year is about 3 billion, give or take, you know, a couple hundred million barrels of oil a day or a year. Okay, so in a 3 billion barrel market, we put 30 million barrels into the marketplace and the price dropped almost $7 a barrel. And the price drop was immediate. The price dropped before the oil moved into the marketplace. Um, and, and, and stayed, it stayed uh, down very, uh, that $7 per barrel for about three weeks. Then the, the USS coal was bombed in the Middle East and the price went back up. But then it fell back down again when, when, uh, when uh, the markets calmed down. So, um, so much of what goes on in the oil marketplace is just speculation. It is panic. It is uh, exploitation of, uh, of out of control, an out of control a sense that the price is just going to go up and up and up with no stop. So uh, to you, uh, Mr. Barry, would the trucking industry, would truckers across the country like to see our President stop filling the Strategic Petroleum Reserve and send a signal to OPEC uh, that we are going to deploy the Strategic Petroleum Reserve um, uh, as a way of signaling that we are not going to stand still and allow our economy uh, to suffer this uh, grievous injury? Uh, that will have negative effect on, on truckers, on consumers, and on industries all across the country? Yes. You would like to see that? Yes. Expand. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, we, we have at, made that request of the administration that they stop filling the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. We don't know precisely what that impact would be. 
but I think even the mere threat of doing that may have an impact on the speculators. And, uh, to, and it just seems silly and ridiculous to me at this time of high prices for us to be adding such a small quantity. And I see very little risk uh, to uh, the, our nation uh, in stopping to stop filling. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? Uh, prices don't go up, so then you resume filling? I mean, I, I see very little risk in the strategy of, uh, of to stop filling the reserves. So this uh, uh, environment in which we're living right now is one where we're buying high at the very peak of the market. The American people, through the Bush administration, are buying oil at $119 a barrel. Uh, and at the same time uh, that we should be selling our oil uh, into uh, the global marketplace to say to the OPEC countries, to say to the oil companies, this is not going to last. And those speculators um, will, in fact, receive that message very quickly and, in my opinion, respond and the consumers will start to see the benefit uh, in the marketplace. You, do you agree with that, Mr. Berry? Mr. Chairman, that is the hope that that is uh, precisely what would happen. Uh, aren't we, uh, uh, Mr. Dr. Rusko, at the worst of, of both worlds right now? Uh, we're wasting taxpayer money uh, and we're raising prices to consumers at the pump simultaneously? Our findings are that, that you could reduce the cost of, of filling the reserve by adopting this practice of putting heavier barrels in there. And if you did that right now with swapping, whatever the effect on the price is, if you swapped light barrels out now for heavier barrels and more of them later, you would alleviate that immediate effect on the price. We do not know what the what the Th actual magnitude of that effect. Thank you, Dr. Rusko. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Shattuck. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in the memo we have from staff, it notes that uh, the Department of Energy is currently filling the SPRO at the rate of 70,000 barrels a day, and it proposes to increase that in August. I find that timing curious to 76,000 barrels a day. Can anybody explain to me why, at least during a portion of the high driving season, we would increase the fill rate? Does anyone? I know there isn't a DOE witness. Does that make sense to anybody? I'll have to ask DOE. Okay. No. Uh, <laughs> Mr. I just, Shattuck, I, um, I, I would just add to that that not only is that the peak driving season for people going on vacation, students returning to school, but it's also when the uh, economic activity uh, starts to uh, rise. All your uh, Christmas, uh, fall shipments start uh, going and the trucking activity is actually picking up then. So any activity that would cause fuel prices to rise during that time would not be good. It's the peak trucking industry or trucking time it's, for the it, Christmas shopping. It's the, uh, it's the advent of the peak. By all means, we ought to put more oil in right then. I guess I'll have to ask DOE about that. Uh, Dr. Rusko, I'm fascinated by uh, your proposal that by swapping heavy, I guess it's swapping light for heavy, uh, we could have a positive effect. Uh, is it your testimony that that could have a, an effect not just on, uh, in terms of beneficially filling this probe, but also in terms of the price of oil and would it have a consequent effect on the price of gasoline? Yes, we uh, we're, we have advocated, long advocated, the um, in introduction of heavy oil into the SPR because it would make it more effective, you know, in the event of a of a supply disruption. It's also been considerably less expensive. It's over the last five years, heavy oil has averaged over twelve dollars a barrel less than than light oil. So you could fill the the, the strategic preserve strategic reserve more cheaply by adding light, heavier oil and make it more effective. Um, and once again, if you did that with a swap where you swapped um, light oil now for heavier oil in the future, you'd be selling essentially light oil out of existing caverns. When they're empty, then you would go and buy heavy oil to fill it. That would have an immediate effect on light oil prices currently. And again, I don't know the magnitude of that effect. I find the idea fascinating. The next question is, so you keep saying we advocate this. Who's resisting it? Uh, and why? And what are the reasons? Well, we, we have recommended that the, that the DOE um, study the maximum amount of heavy oil they could put in. They agree that they should, they should put heavy oil in in the amount of uh, at least 10 percent 
but uh, so far, to our knowledge, they have no intention of doing so until they expand beyond the current level. I'd, happy, I'd be happy to join you and maybe talk further. Maybe some of us in Congress need to talk to them and get answers from them why they're not doing that. Uh, Mr. Book, um, you mentioned that speculation can, in fact, be a part of the current high gas prices. Uh, one of the issues, at least, that Mr. Berry has raised and the trucking industry is concerned about is that if we were to at least stop filling the SPRO or perhaps even release some oil from the SPRO, we could drive down, we could drive out that speculation and maybe have a consequent impact on the price of gasoline. I've heard it said that the price of gasoline is 20 to 40 percent higher than it would be but for the speculation. Um, first question is, do you agree that there is a possibility that we could have that effect? And second, are we also driving speculation by locking up uh, uh, a great deal of the supply that is potentially available in the United States, in the Intermountain West, on the Outer Continental Shelf, in uh, Alaska or elsewhere, and saying, well, it's there, but we're never, ever going to go get it? Uh, is that also driving speculation? Congressman, uh, 70,000 barrels per day is a small amount relative to the global market. It's possible it could have, a, have an effect, but it's certainly not anything like the effect of a sale that's been described, uh, nor is it anything like the effect to your second question that would be uh, immediately signaled if you were to open up some of the off-limits areas, because we have the best oil production technology in the world. We have the best information management technology in the world. We're really a very capable economy. Uh, I suspect the market would take a look at uh, our intent to produce some of our own reserves. Uh, and take it very seriously. On the other hand, to be fair, the effect of that production hitting the market is seven to ten years away from the go decision. But speculators are, in fact, speculating out in the future. So There's that would contracts all the way out to 2016 right now that would probably start to change shape on the basis of that decision, yes. Is there anything else, since I think every member of this panel, Republican and Democrat alike, wants to do what we can do to deal with the spike in gas prices right now, is there anything else you would suggest? Well, the, uh, the idea of tax holidays uh, is, is a symbolic uh, move and a dangerous one. Uh, I think the, the hard part is, is swallowing the bitter medicine and trying to encourage consumers to learn more about ways they can save energy on a daily basis. Well, we're doing that. Thank you very much. Okay. <coughs> Gentleman's time has expired. The, cha the chair recognizes the uh, gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we've heard a lot about how the SPR manipulations can impact the market. What I'd like to know is, are there computer models out there and how sophisticated they are, how much collaboration there is, how much validation there is? In other words, when market manipulations do occur, are the, mo are the, uh, are the mo uh, models validated? Can anyone answer that question? Mr. Brook, uh, you're probably in the best position. Well, there are, there are certainly very sophisticated oil traders who use computer models to try to predict market activity. In terms of my own models, my models as a Wall Street analyst tend to be simple and, based on my current oil price estimates, inadequate. Uh, so I would humbly say that it's very tough to do any kind of simulation of that much activity with that many players and that many variables. And any model, uh, no matter how sophisticated, may not be truly reliable. Um, do you have a, an opinion? Um this is Kesseldine. I'm sorry. Uh, do you have an opinion on that? Um, I, I, w MIT has no models that is looking at at that the level, the granularity that you're talking about, or would need in in that kind of a um, uh, uh, to, to to make that kind of determination. It's very difficult to do. I think Wall Street is the most appropriate place. Um, that they're paying the most attention. So. Well, then, uh, basically, what we've heard is all speculation. I mean, uh, the well, market, uh, the yeah. SPR would look like a spring in a mechanical system. It can make it, uh, it can smooth it out, but it can also make it more unstable. So, I mean, it seems to me that we ought to have a fairly sophisticated market, maybe someone in the University of Chicago or or MIT. Um, MIT. <laughs> <laughs> but the, 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 Activity and what we're seeing, and, and we do have historical data about the use of the SPR, and and the I, I went through and and plot uh, had a, had a, a, a price uh, graph, um, looked at when we went to war in Iraq and we released oil into the market, uh, first time, not second time, because uh, we didn't do it the second time. Looked at uh, uh, when we put the SPR oil. Uh, the exchange we did in 2000 and Katrina, and you see an immediate decline in price on that graph. 
So, so historically, we do know of the impacts of using the SPR. You can also look at the graph and see prices go up when OPEC takes certain actions. So, so um, uh, they're, 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 we, we, we are informed by what we know from the past. And, and certainly traders are looking at these issues constantly. But it's not, it's not necessarily um, uh, transparent what OPEC countries are up to or, you know, it's meant to not be transparent. So. Congressman, go ahead. Yes. Okay. Uh, the historical comps are the best we have. Uh, they're, they're also a different world. Uh, globalization was still in its late childhood, pre-adolescence. Uh, you had a lot of changes in the currency relationships between the dollar and other currencies. Uh, and it's hard with a narrower headroom in global capacity and a different dollar to take those as apples to apples. They're, they're a good place to start. I start there, too. Should we be looking at, in the Congress that commissioning a modeling of this uh, phenomenon? Um, yes. The one thing we should do is, you, you, uh, the lack of transparency in OPEC is one thing. There's not a lot we can do about that. The lack of transparency on, on our commodity markets is something we can do about it. We made a huge mistake in 2002 when we modernized the Commodities Future Trading Commission, Exchange Commission, and failed to ex extend oversight to energy markets. And so now we have a complete lack of transparency in the trading of energy uh, commodities and futures on the over-the-counter markets. We've had a series of continuous series of um, cases brought and settlements signed about uh, abuse of markets. And we're told that the most sophisticated model that ever existed about these markets was Enron's model. And of course, Enron said, you know, it's supply, it's this, it's that, the other thing, and it was cheaters. And um, we've had plenty of court cases. So if we want to learn about what's going on in these markets, we, and Congress passed, in the, uh, passed uh, uh, in the Ag Bill last year, a law that would have closed the Enron loophole. The President vetoed it for all kinds of other reasons. And we're struggling to get that back in. If you want transparency, you need to have the Commodities Future Trading Commission overseeing these markets. They told us they had enough power. And then we had the, the, the effort to, um, to, to corner the, the, the gas market with Amaranth and a whole series of things they don't know. We simply don't know who trades what in this most important commodity. That's the single most important thing you could do to uh, fix the financial speculation problem. The gentleman's time chairman. has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman <coughs> from Connecticut, Mr. Larson. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Cooper. I couldn't agree more with what you have to say. Uh, a colleague of ours, Bart Stupak, has a bill as well called the Pump Act that would do just that. I believe the GAO, even in its recent study, came out and said the CFTC, while it does have regulatory authority, doesn't seem to have the broad exuberance needed or required uh, to be able to uh, look at and, and peel away, especially when it comes to the over-the-counter market, these unregulated activities. Uh, let me ask first uh, Dr. Brooks, uh, excuse me, Dr. Rusco and then Mr. Brooks, uh, whether or not you feel that that would better help in terms of transparency, uh, the initiative that would be required, as my grandfather Nolan would say, to trust everyone but cut the cards. I'm going to have to answer that for the record. That was done in a team outside the energy group, and I would hesitate to offer an opinion without first reviewing that report. I well, if you could get uh, back to them and as part of GAO, I would love to get that, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, for the record. Without objection, it will be included. It also brings up a point that, uh, and I think several, I think it was Mr. Uh, the Chairman or Mr. Blumenauer might have mentioned that the largest consumer of uh, energy, of course, is the federal government. And that being the case, if the federal government were to say, with regard to speculation, that uh, the procurement of oil, the procurement of petroleum for the entire federal system uh, is not subject to speculation, okay. that you have to actually receive, be in recipient uh, in order to uh, be a trader in those areas, what would that do uh, to the price of uh, uh, oil? Would either of you care to respond? I mean, uh, Congressman, it sounds like that proposal would take a substantial volume of oil off market and put it into a tying contract between the, the buyer and the seller. And by reducing the available supply to the market, you might raise the price. 
with a proposal like that. Well, it's in the market currently. If we're purchasing X amount already, uh, but it's subject to the prices driven up by speculation, why, if you eliminated the speculators, would it cost the Federal Government more? And if it cost the Federal Government less, would we be able to therefore release the Strategic Petroleum Reserve or purchase more in a way that would be able to assist our truckers and everybody else throughout the economy? I, I mean, the, the virtues of the idea uh, make sense. The problem is finding a seller who will tie a contract at a time of high prices uh, and say, yes, I will, I will tie it and lock this in with uncertainty and volatility and scarcity on the horizon. Yeah, but if all of we're hearing from our uh, uh, oil uh, executives is that the so laws of supply and demand and volatility and yada, yada, yada no longer apply, then where does it leave policy decision makers with? And if we have unregulated markets that have no transparency and small businesses and oil dealers saying that it's a fraud and a sham and nothing more than uh, you know, a, uh, a charade that's going on that causes our prices to go up while the people, as you pointed out, who are concerned on making the money on paper based on the declining value of the dollar and other volatility or other arguments that they may make uh, and call that the marketplace. Isn't, isn't that? Well, increased transparency is always good for markets. Uh, also, cautious small moves are generally good for markets, particularly when there's a lot of capital in circulation. Uh, I would agree that any move you can make to try to increase accountability without increasing the transaction cost, and that's sort of the flip side of it. The more you regulate something, the more expensive it becomes to trade on that regulated exchange. And this is a global world. Trade can go elsewhere. So you have to balance the two. Well, I'm all in favor of balancing the, the two, but perhaps uh, uh, Ms. Kenderdine could yes. I, I, Transparency is, is terrific for markets. The, the, only, the only concern I have is that 80 to 90 percent of the world's oil reserves are controlled by national oil companies or OPEC. And so if you can have transparency in, in U.S. markets and, and, and on our producers, you are only going to have a very small picture of what is actually going on in global oil markets. So it is just, just a caution that I would put out there. Is, is that th there is not transparency in the rest of the world, and you will only get, you'll only get a small slice and, and, uh, of what is actually going on. And we actually, when I was at DOE, um, th there is also not transparency on, on oil data in general, including demand data. And we launched an effort to try and improve data worldwide so that we could have a better understanding from a government policy perspective, very difficult thing to do. So. I see my time has expired, Mr. Chairman, but I thank you. Okay. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentlelady from South Dakota, Ms. Herseth Stanley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Rusko, I think in response to some of the questions of Mr. Shattig and the recommendations as it relates to more cost effective ways of filling the SPR, he discussed with you the whole issue of heavier versus lighter crude into the SPR. I would like to ask you about the employment of the dollar cost averaging that you discussed. Um, why, aren't the, why isn't that recommendation being employed? I, I don't know why. Um, it, it clearly makes sense. We did simulations that um, estimated the value of dollar cost averaging when prices were generally rising but volatile, generally falling but volatile, or staying generally flat but volatile. And as long as there is volatility in prices, you can, on a month-to-month -month basis, save money uh, and essentially fill the, fill the SPR at the same rate that you want. You just have to pick the right target for the, for the number of dollars. You would have to adjust that target periodically because you don't know where prices will be in the future. But there, there are potentially uh, billions of dollars to be saved as you expand the, the, the um, SPR. Are you aware of any specific opposition to employing this method when making purchases? I think that the, the primary opposition is that, that the DOE has essentially used royalty and kind oil only to fill the, the uh, or almost exclusively to fill the uh, SPR. And since 19, since when, 1999, later? Yeah, than? since about 1999, yes. And, and uh, the, the problem with that is that, that there's no real coordination 
between <coughs> DOE and DOI in terms of how to do that. They could, you could still use royalty and kind oil and adopt um, a, a, a dollar cost averaging approach. You would just, DOI would deliver fewer barrels when prices are high and they would sell the remainder of the RIK barrels in the market and deliver more barrels when the price is low and you could still do it, but it may be a lack of coordination or a lack of imagination. No, you're right. Most likely, I would think you're right on that. Uh, we've seen a lot of lack of coordination yeah, between right. agencies, and if we can save dollars, we appreciate your insight today as we uh, address these issues further. Dr. Cooper, um, uh, your written testimony notes on page six that there is a, quote, disastrous shortfall in domestic refining capacity, uh, and the refinery shortfall has doubled to over three million barrels per day since the early 1990s. Uh, to what factors do you attribute the increasing refining capacity shortfall over that period of time, and what do you think would be the optimal increase in domestic refining capacity over the next five years? Well, the cause of the uh, lack of capacity is clear. The industry has not provided it. Uh, if you look back through the early 1990s, the Clean Air Act amendments were passed in 1990. They went into effect in 1995, and the industry uh, engaged in a series of uh, strategic decisions about what to do. And the central strategic decision was to reduce uh, refinery capacity. Uh, the decision was made not to upgrade certain refineries to meet the Clean Air Act. Decisions were made and mergers were allowed to go forward, which dramatically slashed the number of refiners. So we're down, and you know the names, Exxon Mo Mobil, Chevron, Texaco, BP Arco Amico, um, Conoco Phillips. All of those companies once were separate and now they're one. Um, uh, and so clear decisions made throughout the 1990s about how to tighten the market. There's a very good RAND study which showed a complete change in behavior. They no longer compete for market share on price. Um, and over that time period, we've seen the shortfall increase from about a, a million and a half barrels a day to three million barrels a day. Um, Refinery profits have gone through the roof. Um, so this is the outcome of a policy of, um, of shorting the market, the strategic underinvestment in the domestic refining. And every price spike we've had in the last six or seven years, except this most recent one, was always triggered by some complaints about, oh, we didn't have enough capacity. They couldn't even do spring cleaning switching over from winter fuels to summer fuels without it. So the answer is I believe Dingle and Stupak had a bill in that started to talk about a domestic refinery reserve, operating these refineries to meet military needs in normal times and diverting capacity to serve the market. The oil industry will not build enough refineries in this country. My time's almost up. So in addition to the Dingle Stupak bill, d just an optimal increase over the next five years, what would you say? I mean, um, it'd be wonderful how you're going to make them do it. The oil industry won't do it. You haul them up here and they will tell you why they're not going to build any more refineries. You cannot depend on the oil industry to meet our refinery needs. Okay. The gentlelady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, uh, Mr. Inslee. Uh, thank you. While listening to the testimony, I was reminded of, of what we went through on Enron, um, which was a learning experience. And I remember a, a time where we had a Northwest delegation go meet with Vice President Dick Cheney to beg the, the administration to help us take some action in response to what was going on with prices going up through the roof, roof and electricity. And what we told the Vice President was that there was obvious some, in, quote, imperfections in the market, some manipulation going on. We didn't have adequate oversight over speculation and manipulation. And uh, we told him that one-third of all the power was turned off sort of similar to the refinery situation Dr. Cooper talked about um, at that time while prices were going up a thousand percent. And he looked at us, he says, you know what your problem is? You just don't understand economics. And we did. I su suggest they did not. And we got absolutely taken to the cleaners in the West Coast while the administration sat on its hands and did nothing. And I think that's reminiscent of what we're having here listening to this testimony where there is an abject l lack of action to respond to this in any way. And I just don't believe we are totally helpless in the face of what is going on in the economy. There are these underlying tensions, but there are things we can do, and frankly, we're not doing them because the, the administration 
will not use tools at its disposal nor help us to respond. I want to talk about a longer term issue. We have talked about the short term issue. I want to talk about a longer term. Ms. Karen, Caroline talked about the need for research and development dollars to really develop a post-carbon based economy. And that might be my terms rather than Ms. Caroline's, but it is the way I think of it. Um, and I wonder if you can just go in a little greater depth what you view as the shortfall in research and development to develop non-carbon based fuel systems, fuels and fuel systems. I alluded to these electric cars that are, are now starting to hit the road. Could you just tell us what you think is in the realm, should be in the realm of our scope of our ambition in research and development to wean ourselves off of being so oil and gas dependent? But the reason I use the numbers on the challenges is because the, the magnitude of the need, the magnitude of the requirements is, needs to be well understood. And, and you know, we, we're, talking, we're not talking about um, telephones, widgets, et cetera, in terms of innovation. We are talking about a major commodity-based industry has a 40-year, its infrastructure has a 40-year lifespan, and we are facing right now under business as usual carbon emissions a catastrophic event by 2050 beyond the doubling of CO2 emissions in the atmosphere if we do not do something and do something now. The, um, the uh, as I mentioned, the uh, infrastructure value that we are going to have to turn over in the next 40 years is $12 trillion. Um, we have, we have uh, significant challenges. We have to go from 80, 80 percent carbon-based fuels to not to, uh, and I agree with you, a uh, uh, carbon, carbon-free, carbon, perhaps carbon light is kind of the interim um, uh, that we are going to have to uh, support in order to get to those goals. Um, and by carbon light, I would say sequestration. Um, is going to be critical in order for us to get there, as well as natural gas, because it's, it, it produces so much fewer uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But, um, but the and, and we have done modeling on this at MIT. Uh, incredible uh, uh, um, gains in reductions of CO2 emissions uh, in efficiency technologies, uh, both uh, uh, and that's in part a deployment issue. Um, uh, and uh, but we need uh, biofuels. Obviously, we need uh, uh, alternative. Um, uh, uh, we need, we, quite frankly, we need nuclear in order to get there. Um, and and so the, 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 the R and D investments are. And I said we have uh, five to six billion dollars total investment, U.S. government and industry in the U.S. To turn over a twelve trillion dollar infrastructure. And what should be our national goal as far as R and D? What's a reasonable R and D figure we should be shooting at in the next several years? Right now, the Department of Energy, on its applied energy R and D programs, and, and I set aside the science office um, because while it's doing basic research, energy research, it's not strategic research. It is research for research's sake, for knowledge's sake. Um, we are only spending maybe three, 3 billion a year um, in, uh, in energy R&D. I, I think a doubling of that is absolutely essential. Um, I, I think also a carbon price is essential. And I know that the Congress is debating the carbon price. We can put a price on carbon. We still don't have the technologies to produce affordable renewable energy at this point, so we need the research. And um, so a combination of an increase in R&D, much more focused R&D, I think we need to do it better than we have done in the past, and a carbon price will, uh, will is, is, I believe, critical. And I double the R&D budget. Thank you. The gentleman's mm -hmm. time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenau. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would just like to clarify, um, do any of you, any of you feel that there is um, any question but that we should regulate uh, petroleum uh, and gasoline through the commodities future trading market? Any of you disagree with that proposition? Um, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure I would use the re word regulate. Certainly oversight on the part of the CFTC yes, they are included is, yes, within yes, the regime. Yes, yes. Is there any reason to exclude them? 
any longer. Again, I, I cannot comment on that, so I don't, I don't want my silence to be Okay. viewed as... GAO exception noted. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I would just say that the trucking industry, I don't think it's considered specifically that point. As one member of the trucking industry, um, it seems reasonable to me, the proposal. Uh, Mr. Berry, I, I appreciate that. Would it be possible to check with your association yeah. about um, running it through the trap line and see where they are? Because yes. they're a pretty big player in this game. Yes, we'll, we'll get back. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I, I must say that I, I do appreciate the comprehensive nature of your testimony in particular. Um, um, I've had the opportunity uh, in recent days um, out campaigning in uh, Pennsylvania, maybe not to very good effect for, for Senator Obama, um, but hearing very heart-rendering direct reactions from people who, who can only afford to fill up a third of the tank um, and making it real I thought was very important. Could you, uh, I, and I, the notion that you have in terms of some specific things in terms of reducing demand which I welcome from ATA, uh, the section that you had in your testimony, uh, touching what some feel is the third rail, like, you know, should we take a look again at controlling speeds? Uh, because we did move in that direction 30 years ago to significant effect. And even uh, the notion of reducing idling, we've had legislation, we've tried to fix this to be able to help, uh, what, APUs, uh, so that we don't have the whole rig uh, burning uh, expensive uh, diesel. This is an example uh, to me of simple common sense items that ought to be employed in a heartbeat that make sense, save money. Uh, do you want to elaborate on that for a moment? I'd, I'd, I'd be happy to. Um, at a great personal risk, I will tell you that um, it's our association's uh, position that there should be a 65 mile an hour speed limit and that um, that would save a tremendous amount of uh, fuel. And I would uh, venture to say that it would probably save as much as 10% of our annual consumption. And that's a big number. The, um, uh, our own company has reduced our speed in December from 65 to 64 miles an hour and our trucks are governed so that we can set it with the computer. And then here three weeks ago in response to the high price of fuel, we reduced our speed even further to 62 miles an hour. Now we did that at great risk because there's a shortage of truck drivers and we felt as though we might be disarming in the uh, unilaterally in the war to attract truck drivers. Um, but our drivers all understood the need. They see the $4 uh, price uh, at the uh, truck stops and they willingly re voluntarily reduce their speed and we've had uh, wonderful compliance. They get it. They know this is a huge problem and, um, and, and they were on board with it. But anti-idling, um, uh, Representative Inslee talked about um, uh, research and development. There's a lot of common sense solutions coming from the users, and the users are left out of all these equations. And I think that the users need to be included in the research and development. There's trucking companies are coming up with fabulous ideas, common sense solutions, and those should be uh, incorporated. Anti-idling, we're looking at battery power. We can't get the battery power to work because with cabs need to be better insulated. So we're all out there experimenting with ways to better insulate the cabs. Uh, EPA's Smartway program is a, a fabulous program that is looked at different technologies, has put it out on the internet so truckers can see what works, what doesn't work, and that's been a huge service. And so, uh, oh, those are all uh, examples of things that can be done. I, I, I appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate, as I say, the, the comprehensive testimony that you've offered up. Uh, we're working to try and fix that APU uh, item yeah. in the Ways and Means Committee. We've got a little glitch. But I think in total, this was extraordinarily helpful. Mr. Chairman, I really appreciate your uh, allowing us to come together to analyze this. Uh, I thank uh, the gentleman from, um, um, uh, from Oregon, and I thank all of our witnesses. I think this has been an extremely helpful uh, hearing. I think it's clear uh, from today's uh, testimony uh, that President Bush must deploy the Strategic Petroleum Reserve uh, in order to send a signal to OPEC that we are going to stop begging, uh, to send a signal to the speculators 
um, that we are going to begin to take action uh, against them uh, and to send a signal uh, to um, those who are uh, afraid of the impact on the trucking industry, on the food industry, on the airline industry, and all other industries of this dramatic rise in the price of, of uh, fuel, uh, that we are not going to allow a competition um, uh, here to uh, raise the price of oil to have such a dramatic impact uh, upon our economy. Uh, poor people have to choose between fuel and food. This is not something that America should allow to happen. This is not something that President Bush should sit on the sidelines and pretend he is powerless to do something about. If President Bush can call up the reserves over and over again to go to Iraq, he can deploy the Strategic Petroleum Reserve as a weapon uh, against OPEC and big oil to protect the American consumer and American industry here at home. I think that's clear from the testimony that we heard here today. We thank all of our witnesses uh, for this testimony, and we hope that uh, President Bush hears the plea of the American people. This hearing is adjourned. Can I talk to you two guys? Yeah, I'd like to ask you. Yes. That was going to be too soon. Take it easy. In a few moments, a discussion of the murder of a former KGB officer and allegations that Russian government officials are responsible.